Is that a stick? What are you going to do with that? Ow! Ow, me knuckles! Now you die. <laughs> well, everyone, it happened again. Remember last year when Encanto came out and I made a short video on that? And then just a few months later, I made a longer, more in-depth video about it? Well, consider this deja vu because we're doing it again. Puss in Boots The Last Wish is the best animated movie to come out last year. I am still absolutely floored by the fact that Puss in Boots The Last Wish is as good as it is. Not just better than what most people expected, but easily one of the best DreamWorks films ever made. It's easily up there with movies like How to Train Your Dragon, Kung Fu Panda, and even The Prince of Egypt. And while I don't think it's as good as any of those movies, the fact that it comes so close at times is truly astonishing. Puss in Boots 2, are you freaking kidding me? And just like with Encanto, which I feel has gotten better the more I watch it, the same thing has happened with Puss in Boots The Last Wish. But unlike Encanto, which has its fair share of people who think the movie's bad for reasons that are perfectly acceptable, even if I don't agree with them, Puss in Boots The Last Wish, on the other hand, has become universally loved by just about everyone. Seriously, I haven't seen a single person out there who dislikes this movie. Not a single person or bad review anywhere. Which is fine by me. I know some of you want to see me review an American Tale, finally, or Kid Cosmic Season 2, and I'll get to them eventually, but Puss in Boots The Last Wish is one of the greatest animated movies of all time! I mean seriously, it's beautiful, it's funny, it's emotional, it's fresh, you know, like HelloFresh. That's right, this video is sponsored. This video is brought to you by HelloFresh. HelloFresh is the number one delivery service that helps bring delicious, easy to prepare meals right to your doorstep. HelloFresh has a wide variety of culinary delights that even the pickiest of eaters will enjoy. Chicken, burgers, tacos, pork, steak, and many more. Forget the hassle of going to the grocery store and interacting with people. Ill gross, when these great meals are brought straight to you and are easily prepared in as short as 15 minutes. Cooking has never been this easy. So what are you waiting for? You like food, don't you? Well, if you use my link in the description and pinned comment, and then use my code, you'll get your first 21 meals for free. And I mean, absolutely free. You won't even pay for shipping. It's free food, and you'll be supporting my channel. It's a win-win for us both. So special thanks to HelloFresh again for sponsoring this video. Now, where were we? Oh yeah, Cats the movie, but good. Seriously, it's been a long time since I've seen the internet be this universally undivided when it comes to a movie being this good. And to think it's a sequel to a movie that came out 11 years ago and was only seen as okay by most people. I still have yet to see it, but from what most people have told me, it's a perfectly fine movie that exists and that's about it. I've also been told that The Last Wish is actually a really great standalone film that doesn't require you to watch the first movie or even any of the Shrek films, which is crazy to think about. They really wanted Puss in Boots to be able to stand alone on his own two boots, which I think is a great idea. Taking a character that was supposed to be mostly just a gag character who offers comic relief but not much else, and then suddenly giving them a large amount of character development? That honestly rarely works, but when it does, that's when you know you're in for something spectacular. I mean, this is DreamWorks after all. Like, what is this, the fourth or fifth time this has happened to them? Unlike Pixar, which had a really long streak of nearly flawless movies, followed by a whole decade of really flawed movies, save for like one or two exceptions, DreamWorks' catalog was always a bit more muddy. It's all over the place in terms of quality, going from absolute shit to what the fuck, DreamWorks made this? Yeah, if you told me someone else made The Prince of Egypt and I didn't know it was DreamWorks yet, I would 100% believe you. But while DreamWorks does have its stinkers here and there, this just makes their accomplishments all the more noticeable and significant. I was too young to remember the hype around Shrek, but I remember my dad saying it looked awful, but with me and my sister being little kids at the time, he took us to see it anyway, and then on the ride back home, I remember him saying, huh, that actually wasn't half bad. So that's my experience with Shrek. Then in 2008, Kung Fu Panda showed up, and judging from the trailers, my dad also said that movie looked like garbage, and me being 13 at the time, agreed. But then it aired on TV one day eventually, and I was like, oh my god, this movie is actually amazing. What is wrong with me for not going to see this in theaters? Kung Fu Panda was the movie that made me realize that just because it's animated doesn't mean it's only for kids or that it's automatic garbage. And considering that movie's lesson about not judging others for how they look, Boy, did that movie teach the lesson well. Then in 2010, How to Train Your Dragon came out. I remember my friends at school were watching the trailer, and they all thought it looked stupid. But by this point, I was willing to give it a fair shot, despite not really liking the trailer that much either. And, uh, yeah, it's one of the greatest animated movies of all time. Words do not describe how good How to Train Your Dragon is. It's 
practically perfect in every way from the animation to the dragon designs to the score to the just just everything literally everything the sequels the tv show the nine re okay that's excluded but you get my point what i'm saying is sometimes the marketing of dreamworks will do a movie dirty the trailer will make it look like the most childish kitty crap you can imagine and then the movie itself will surprise you and be really good and that's exactly what happened with puss in boots the last wish I wasn't all that hyped to go see this movie since I never saw the original film. And again, it's Puss in Boots The Last Wish. Outside of the animation, it just didn't really grab me all that much. But boy was I wrong. DreamWorks, you son of a bitch! You did it again! You made an animated film that's actually amazing and surprised the hell out of everyone! And I couldn't be more happy to admit I was wrong. The more I think about this movie, the better it gets. Almost to a point where the first video I made is kind of outdated at some points, like with Jack Horner. No, not Jack Horner. Seriously, I regret ever calling him the weakest villain in this movie. He is hilarious. So damn funny that I refuse to play too many clips of him because some of these jokes you just gotta see for yourselves. Jack Horner is an absolute monster in the best way. And yes, he is a monster. He practically admits to it. You're an irredeemable monster! Oh, oh, what took you so long? Fucking dick! <laughs> After seeing so many twist villains and generational trauma over the years, it's so nice to finally have a villain that just plain doesn't give a shit. Just a cold-blooded killer who wants to cause as much havoc as physically possible and will stop at absolutely nothing to do it. Jack Horner might just be the most chaotic evil person that we've seen in an animated movie in a long time. You see, Disney? Sure, not every movie needs a villain, but damn it, we need villains! We love hating them and singing their epic songs and seeing them do awesome shit. Bring back villains, Disney! Everyone wants you to! You're really gonna let your old rival get one up on you? Because DreamWorks thoroughly whooped your ass last year with two movies against your three. Boy, that's embarrassing. I like how Jack just straight up doesn't have a motivation. I mean, I guess the most we get is him being butthurt over Pinocchio being more popular than him when he was a kid, so I guess that explains why he wants all the magic in the world. But it's not like he wants revenge specifically against Pinocchio. He just wants all that power so he can rule the world. And that's it. And if anyone's got a problem with it, he'll just fucking kill you. And in the most hilarious slash graphic way possible, like turning you to gold or shooting a unicorn horn in your ass. Not to mention he's got some great one-liners here and there too. You're not gonna shoot a puppy, are you, Jack? Yeah, in the face, why? The perfect blend that makes for an incredible villain. Just such a refreshing thing to see. No backstory, no layers. Jack ain't no onion or cake or parfait. He's a pie. A dirty, nasty pie that's rotten to the core. Ah, you piece of shit! You create something! Like inward singing! That was weird. Looking back on my first video, I think it was kind of wrong to rank the villains of this movie from best to worst, as all of them bring something different to the table. Jack Horner is the pure evil comical one, Goldilocks isn't really a villain, but instead she's more relatable and emotional of the three, and even parts on good terms with our heroes. And then, there's him. Yeah, I think everyone agrees he's the best part of the film. I mean, oh my god. When was the last time you saw a villain in an animated movie that was this frightening? From the voice, to the direction, to the animation, he is just so unforgettable. Despite having the least amount of screen time of the three antagonists. He has like, what? 10 minutes of screen time total in the movie, and he's this memorable? I still can't get over that first encounter. I love how you can see Puss's confusion in the shot glass as Death picks it up. That's such a great touch. And the dialogue too, what a great way to foreshadow who Death is without making it a dead giveaway. Pussy Puss laps in the face of Death. So I've heard. Like, yeah, he would have heard him laughing, wouldn't he have? Everyone thinks he'll be the one to defeat me. But no one's escaped me yet. Kinda makes sense for death to be this prideful since that's just plain true. Can you name a single person or animal that's escaped death before or even could? Well, Spike can, but he and Death have an understanding, so he's the exception. Another thing I've noticed with Death is the direction between him and Puz. In the opening battle with the giant, did you notice how the camera usually puts Puz on the same level or even above the giant? The only time the giant is seen looking down on Puz is when he breaks into the mansion, catching Puz off guard. But after that, 
octopus quickly enters the same level and eventually raises higher than the giant, showcasing just how skilled Puss really is. He's not just cocky for no reason, he actually has earned his reputation and legacy, which I think is great. I like that Puss isn't a liar, he's truly capable of all the things that he brags about, which justifies his ego even more. Definitely better than a certain other egotistical asshole who talked big shit who was also voiced by Antonio Banderas. You fucking bitch! In this fight, the camera always puts Puss on an equal level or a higher level. Puss is always viewed as bigger than the giant, either from a perspective shot with the giant being far away or Puss being in the air coming towards him. But when it comes to death, it's a different story. Because with him, death is always over Puss. Looking down on him, looming over him, bigger than him. It doesn't matter how big Puss's ego is, death will always be bigger. It's truly brilliant direction. By the way, did I ever mention that the director of this movie, Joel Crawford, is also going to be directing Kung Fu Panda 4? Yes! Even in the final battle between Death and Puss, Death is still being viewed as larger than Puss because despite his victory, it's a pretty hollow one because there is no defeating Death. Not truly. Puss gets to live his last life but it's still just a life, one that death will take eventually, just like he did with all the others. Seriously, when he said that he was there for all of Puss's previous deaths, he meant it, because when you go back and watch the battle between Puss and the giant, there he is in the crowd watching! He's literally about to watch Puss lose his eight life! They didn't have to do that, but that's so good. Death is literally the best part of this movie. Every scene with him in it is a showstopper. From the first meetup where he effortlessly defeats Puss, to the scene in the Cave of Lost Souls where he smashes all of Puss's previous lives, further representing how he was there for them all, the way his eyes light up to that haunting whistle. God damn, we need more villains like Death! Also, I got a lot of comments on my first video of people telling me that Death actually isn't a villain. He's just doing his job. If anything, he was trying to teach Puss a lesson in appreciating his last life. No. He's a villain. Like, straight up a villain. He wants to beat that pussy so bad that even Pornhub wouldn't allow it on its website. He literally tells Puss to his face that he wants to kill him because he hates the idea of someone having nine lives and the fact that Puss didn't value a single one of them. Puss calls him out for this and says that he's cheating. And how does Death respond? I just love the smell of this ratio! Or something like that. I'm pretty sure that's what he said. He kept sparing Puss and let him run because he just loves the chase. He likes watching his targets struggle in fear because he finds the smell of fear intoxicating. Not to be racist or anything. And even in the end, when Death starts yelling in Spanish, someone in the comments actually translated what he said, which was, why the hell did I have to play with my food? He's not happy Puss learned a lesson. He's angry Puss learned a lesson. He thought that by killing Puss, he'd be doing them both a favor since he thought he was taking nothing of value. But now there is value. So Death, in good faith, can't go through with it anymore. Game recognized game, that's all it is. Doesn't change the fact that he still takes great pleasure in watching his victims suffer in fear. Funny how literal Death is only the second worst sociopath in your movie. Jack Horner is way more evil than Death ever could dream of. And you have no problem believing that. But with that said, it's still so crazy how DreamWorks let a villain like Death exist. There's no levity, no holding back, just an unfiltered, violent, and truly terrifying villain that makes your hair stand up, knows what he wants, and always gets it. And yet, there's still another antagonist to talk about. Out of the three antagonists, Goldilocks and the Three Bears are the only ones you definitely can't call villains. Sure, they're a crime family, but you can tell by the way they act towards each other, and even to our heroes sometimes, they're not bad people. Not really. They're not like Jack, who would kill them and then take a shit on their graves for laughs, or Death, who would stalk them and haunt their nightmares before finishing them off. All they care about is getting the map and finding the wishing star. They're also a really good fit in the world of Shrek, since Shrek is the subversion of typical fairy tales. So where the original story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears was super cute and wholesome, in the Shrek universe? They're gangsters who aren't afraid to beat up old ladies and rob you at claw point. But despite all that, they're an adorable family. They sing stupid songs with each other, they bicker and fight each other all the time, but by the end of the day, they're still a family who cares very deeply about each other. They don't want to become a crime syndicate, they want to become a crime family. However, unknown to the bears, Goldilocks has her own wish in mind. Something that cleverly ties into the overall theme of the film. Just like Encanto did, Puss in Boots The Last Wish does a great job in having everything tie into the message without being too on the nose or obnoxious about it. Jack feels like he's owed all the magic in the world because he's just that spoiled rotten. He straight up just refuses to appreciate what's in front of him and won't stop until he gets more. Death wants to punish our main character because of the way that he didn't appreciate what he had. And now Goldilocks has to learn that what she wants might already be in front of her. 
There are these scenes where Goldie and the Bears are just playing around with each other. They sing little songs and talk about mother-daughter secrets. These scenes confirm exactly what I said in my first video. These guys are dorks, but there's a cute charm to their dorkiness and it helps showcase just how close they are as a family. How close Goldie is to this family. Eventually you start to wonder, why is Goldie gonna make the wish she wants? It seems like she does have everything she ever wanted. There's this great scene where they have the magic map and it recreates their cottage. The bears are really happy to be back home, or at least what they think is home, but Goldie just wants to leave and move on. This is pretty much the only flaw that I have with this movie. I really think Goldie should have revealed her wish here in the cottage instead of right before the big climax. If she had done that, this would be a 10 out of 10 film. I'm not kidding when I say that. Not exaggerating or anything, this movie would pretty much be perfect. But as it is, it just makes the drama of them finding out the truth and then reconciling later just feel kind of rushed because the movie's almost over by that point. If she had revealed her secret here, we could have seen more of how the bears would react to that. Maybe get a scene where Baby tells her not to go through with it and that he'd miss her. The tension would weigh heavy on Goldie's chest as she begins to realize just what she's sacrificing for the wish. The map would tell her again that she might not need the wish, but coming this far and seeing both Jack and Puss make it there first, she commits anyway with the bears vowing to stick with her because they care about her despite what she's doing. It's a small change but I think it would have gone a long way and it would have made the reconciliation in the end all the more sweeter. But with that being said, it's still really sweet nonetheless. They have a great family dynamic and are just really fun to watch in their own right. As I said before, I'd be totally down to watch a spinoff film with just them. They're really great characters. Seriously, it's insane how this movie was able to balance not just one, not just two, but three separate antagonists, and they are all great in their own right. Each of them gets just enough screen time to where they can make you laugh, make you cry, and make you shake with fear. And to think, all of these great villains all came from a movie about Puss in Boots. Again, are you freaking kidding me? Puss in Boots was always a comic relief character. He was a fun character, but just a comic relief one. Again, I haven't seen the first movie, but everybody tells me that it's just in the okay territory. So whatever character development he gets from it, I'm sure it's fine. I don't really care. But damn, I wasn't expecting Puss in Boots to be this deep. You don't see this kind of thing for comic relief characters. Sheen didn't get this kind of treatment. He just got an awful garbage ass TV spinoff. God fuck Planet Sheen. So in the beginning of the film, we see Puss in Boots as this awesome, badass guy who lives on the high life and doesn't take life that seriously. And what better way to showcase that for the audience than with a song? Seriously, you guys, Fearless Hero does not have the right to be this much of a banger track. It's so fun. Seriously, if I had a nickel for every time a Shrek movie had an epic musical number without being a musical, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it's happened twice, right? And while I don't think it's as good as I Need a Hero from Shrek 2, it still comes pretty close and perfectly encapsulates the ego that Puss has about himself. Who's the gato who rolls the dice and gambles with his life? Who's ever been touched by a blade? Despite winning the fight against the giant, though, his hubris is what ends up killing him. Despite this, though, he seems to be perfectly fine with the fact that he just died, as it's happened eight times before. Which means our favorite fearless hero is now down to one. His last life. But fuck that, he's the legend! Nobody can stop the legend that is Puss and Boots! He laughs in the face of death! And just like that, everything is different. After being nicked by Death's Blade, a single drop of blood pours down his face. You think with it being an animated kids film, that was probably a spilled drink or something, right? But no. It's blood. Puzz's blood. And in that moment, he realizes that he can't win against this guy. His fur begins to stand up in fear, something it's never done before. And Puzz's lives flash before his eyes. Overwhelmed by the sudden realization that he won't come back from this, he runs, with death not far behind. Finally, it sinks in the weight of his actions. His carelessness throughout his life has caused him to be on his last one. And if he can be beaten that easily and die that easily, is he really a legend at all? The legend is supposed to be this fearless, heroic, invincible hero. But Puss has lost all that now. There's no coming back from this. There is no more Puss in Boots. Or is there?
After Goldie and the bears attack the cat lady's home and then shove her into a piano. <laughs> My god, look at that face. Puss learns about the wishing star and how it can give him his lives back. And helping him with his journey is Burrito! Yeah! Burrito is the best character in this movie next to death. Seriously, if I had a nickel for every dog that was great in this movie. Nah, I'm just kidding. I'm not doing that joke twice. But Burrito is no joke. He is awesome. I really thought I was going to hate him judging from the marketing of this movie. I really thought he was going to get on my nerves and just be super annoying the whole time. But no, he's actually really funny and likable and kind of a tragic character. What's your name? Oh, I've been called all kinds of things. Dog, bad dog, stupid dog, hey you, rat face, butt nugget, for brains, you know, that sort of thing. Hearing his backstory is pretty funny, but man, it also really makes you feel for him. I guess it's good that he never realized that his life's been shit up to this point, but his positive attitude and optimistic outlook on life is a great counterbalance to Puss and Kitty's pessimism. You of all people should have a wish. I already have a comfy sweater and two best friends. I got everything I could wish for. No magic required. Oh my god, you're so fucking cute! One of the best scenes in the movie is that scene where Puss sees death again while finding Jack, and he runs away in fear. He starts seeing death around every corner until he eventually collapses out of breath against a tree. Perito follows him into the woods and finds him breathing heavily. Puss doesn't respond to any of the words that Perito says, so Perito sits with him and lays his head down on his chest. The music plays softly, and Puss's breathing begins to slow down. His heart pounds slower, and then finally, a sigh of relief. A lot of people have said that this is the best scene in the movie for them because of its stunning and realistic depiction of a panic attack. Even the storyboard artist Taylor Meech admitted that he pulled it off from his own panic attacks to try and make it more accurate. It's really cool to see an animated movie made for kids not be afraid to show things like this in a realistic manner. That even a guy as brave and as heroic as Puss in Boots is, a guy who's faced off against a literal giant in the beginning of the film, can have his weaknesses and be vulnerable. It's a perfect testament that shows that just because it's animated, doesn't mean it's just for kids. I like how this movie decisively earns its PG rating. It has blood, a bit of swearing, and tons and tons of gratuitous death, which I think is great. I love all this death. Anyone else get a weird sense of deja vu there? Huh, guess it's just me. Later in the movie, when Puss gets trapped in the Cave of Lost Souls, he meets his previous lives and all the different personalities that they had. I like how they all had a different addiction of some kind. One was addicted to partying, another addicted to getting swole or singing or something. It's a great showcase on how people grow out of their old habits as they get older, but it also raises a question that most people don't ask. You know that age-old question, what would you do or say if you met your younger self? Well, I got a question for you. What would your younger self do or say to you? You think there's a good possibility that maybe they'll make fun of you for changing? Maybe you had a dream at some point that you were really dedicated to, but as you got older, your priorities changed, and so you changed. That old dream is no longer your desire, so your younger self who still believes in that dream would probably make fun of you and call you a sellout which is exactly what happens to Puz. They laugh at him and call him names and even make fun of him befriending Perito and rekindling his old romance with Kitty, saying that the legend must walk alone, something that Puss deep down always hated. He retorts that they're all jerks, which is very conflicting for him since they are him, but soon after, Death returns. Death explains why he wants to kill Puss so badly because he took it personally how he would literally laugh in his face and didn't value the lives that he had. The music, the animation, it's all just so gripping, intense, and chilling. Puss is able to escape the cave and make it to the wishing star, but before he can make his wish, Kitty calls him out for his cowardice and lying to her, saying that all she wanted from the wish was someone that she could trust. It was explained earlier in the movie that Puss and Kitty were actually going to get married, but Puss, still wanting to be the legend, left her at the altar. But then it's revealed that Kitty didn't go to the wedding either, knowing that Puss wouldn't go himself. What? because she believed that she couldn't compete with the legend of Puss in Boots. Kitty is a great testament to how great of a standalone film that this is. I know she was Puss's love interest in the first movie, but despite not seeing it, I have no problem in believing that there was a romance between these two. Puss not showing up to their wedding feels very believable as working to protect his image has always been on the forefront of this movie. But after talking to Puss and clearing the air, you realize that the feelings are still there for both of them. I like how Perito admits that he doesn't want to wish because he's already got two friends that make him happy, no magic required. And then Kitty quotes that later to tell Puss that she got what she wanted for by meeting him again, further showcasing that Perito is indeed the best boy. But then, we hear that haunting whistle again. Death walks through the magic wall with no effort, and the final battle begins. Death gives Puss his old sword back, hoping he'll pick it up. And in that moment of fear, Puss's life flashes before his eyes. But not his previous ones, but his last one. 
Burrito, Kitty, both of them appear more than anything else. A tear drops from Puss's face as he realizes just what this life has to offer him. The final battle between Puss and Death is amazing both from a visual standpoint and a thematic one. He faces Death head on now because the lives he had before no longer matter. None of the singing or lifting or eating or fighting can compare to a life he can have with his best friend and the woman he loves. He doesn't need to be the legend anymore. So in a way, Puss in Boots did die in this fight, but he was reborn as a new Puss in Boots, something that Death himself acknowledges when he admits that he doesn't see the legend anymore. So he tells the new Puss in Boots to live his life well, but mentions that they will again fight one day. Puss in Boots The Last Wish is easily the best animated film of 2022, and it's my pick for the best animated feature at the Oscars. Not that the Oscars actually care about animation, but if Guillermo del Toro wins for Pinocchio, I will totally be cool with that. I don't care if DreamWorks doesn't win, I just want Disney to lose. Seriously, they've won enough! Let someone who actually earned the award actually have it this year, okay? Puss in Boots The Last Wish surpassed every expectation that I had for it. It's not only a great standalone film, it also has a truly imaginative story, a wonderful score, a great message about the value of life and mortality. It turned what was originally a comic relief character into perhaps the deepest character in the entire franchise. It gave us some incredible villains, including perhaps the best villain of any DreamWorks film, and not to mention, it's absolutely beautiful. This is perhaps the best looking DreamWorks film ever made. The brushstroke aesthetic is such an inspired choice since the whole point of the Shrek franchise is that it's based on old fairy tales. The colors in the movie pop so distinctly and the textures really help everything and everyone stand out. Even the characters have that brushstroke look to them, on their skin, their fur, their clothes. When you compare this puss to the old puss, you can see a distinct difference. And while the old puss still looks good for the time, it's honestly pretty iffy looking at the new one and seeing just how memorable and expressive he looks. Also, I never thought a talking cat would give me a massive Mandela effect. Seriously, do you mean to tell me that his hat was never that big? Or that he never wore a cape before this? I feel so lost. The stylized animation and the lack of fluidity really help the action sequences feel more alive and give this movie its own look compared to the other Shrek films or even its predecessor. Despite taking influence from Spider-Verse, I like how this movie adds its own art style which helps it feel like its own thing. Where Spider-Verse wanted to look like a comic book, this wants to look more like a storybook, which is fantastic. The opening battle, the dark forest, the cave of lost souls, the final battle, it all looks so beautiful. It makes for an incredible visual experience alone. Honestly, I have nothing but phrase for this movie. Outside of that one little change I would have made with Goldilocks, this movie is so damn close to perfect that it's scary. Almost as scary as Death himself. It's truly astonishing and it makes me really excited just to see what DreamWorks is going to make next. I hope they stick with this cool art style with their future films and I hope they keep Joe Crawford around because he's proving he's definitely an underrated gem. I can't wait to see what he brings to Kung Fu Panda 4. It's gonna be insane. I can already tell. As for Puss in Boots The Last Wish, it's nothing short of amazing. But come on, I don't think you need me to tell you that. I think it's pretty clear to everyone at this point, it's a fantastic movie that gives me high hopes that DreamWorks is in the middle of its own renaissance. And I for one, can't wait to see what wishes DreamWorks brings to life in the future. Also, this girl is just Rough Nut from How to Train Your Dragon. Like, I can't be the only one who noticed that, right? This is literally just Rough Nut from How to Train Your Dragon. SOMEONE VALIDATE ME! <laughs>